Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Say good morning back. Say good morning back. Say good morning back. All right. Good morning. Um, so everyone who was here last night, it is great to see you again. And everyone who just got in this morning, it is great to see you. Um, I am still Jamie Bennett, the executive director of Art Place, and it is still exciting to be here in Philadelphia with all of you. Um, and as I had mentioned last night, and just want to reiterate this morning, we're lucky enough in the Art Place partnership to have two foundations uh, who have a deep commitment to what's going on here in Philadelphia, both within the arts and also broadly um, in the community, to make sure that Philadelphia remains an exciting, vibrant city uh, that is inclusive and healthy and thriving for all of the people who live and work in it. So I wanted to invite up our colleague Laura Sparks, who is the executive director of the William Penn Foundation, to offer one of two official welcomes uh, to kick off this morning. So please join me in welcoming Laura Sparks. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, Great to see many of you again this morning. I saw many of you last night. I see also a lot of new faces. And since many of you weren't here to join me yesterday in thanking Jamie and the entire Art Place team, I want to do that again. It's one thing to, um, to host an event in your home city. It's always an, a nice thing. But to be able to do it with such an extraordinary team is a real gift. Um, so thank you so much for putting together such a robust agenda. <laughs> So we are so thrilled to welcome you to Philadelphia, the birthplace of American democracy. Great things happen here. Um, not only is it the birthplace of American democracy, but it is, we believe, the birthplace of creative placemaking. Um, almost 150 years ago, in 1872, the Association for Public Art was founded here as the nation's first private, nonprofit organization dedicated to integrating art and urban planning. In addition to continuing to commission new works, the association maintains um, an inventory of over 1,400 works of public art in Philadelphia. So we are steeped in a culture of the intersection of art and space and community making. Um, in 1959, Philadelphia started the first 1% for Art program in the United States, and it's a policy that has been replicated by the federal government and countless other cities and governments across the country. Does that sound a little familiar <laughs> to what we're trying to do here? Um, Art Place has been such an important catalyst in really taking that work to the next level, and you'll hear about lots of examples here in Philadelphia. We're excited to share them with you and for you to get out and see them this afternoon. Um, so I won't uh, spend a ton of time going through the countless wonderful examples, um, but I will mention two. Um, in 2012, the William Penn Foundation um, and Art Place um, supported a project called The Porch at 30th Street Station, and hopefully some of you who took the train into Philadelphia had a chance to experience it. Um, 30th Street Station is the nation's second busiest train station, and artists were engaged to really design this incredible public space um, and to create uh, public art that really brought it to life. It's really a gateway to our city in many ways, and artists were at the center of making it a really special place in the city. Um, the porch is animated with performances and pop-up farmers markets and food trucks and has really become a go-to place for people who are living and working in the city. So if you didn't experience it on your way in, hopefully you can experience it while you're here or, or on your way out. Um, last night I mentioned Spruce Street Harbor Park and I know Dennis wanted to um, poo-poo the idea of it being an urban beach compared to Miami. But it did, in fact, make the list of the top eight urban beaches in the world. Um, that was an Art Place project. That would not have happened but for Art Place. Um, and I will note that it shared residency on that list of the top eight urban beaches in the world with um, the likes of Paris, Toronto, London, Vienna, Chicago, Berlin, Brussels. So thank you, Art Place. Um, but outside of making its way onto a really wonderful list that we were proud of in Philadelphia. Um, perhaps more importantly, it welcomed five million visitors last summer to a space that had previously felt abandoned in many ways. 35,000 people a week visited that Art Place project, over half of which got there by foot, by bike, or by public transportation. 
and they arrived at a place that was formerly pretty barren um, and was transformed into a bustling, artistic, vibrant space where visitors and residents from all across the city really came together to make community. Um, my first trip to uh, Spruce Street Harbor Park was terrific. Not only was <laughs> I excited to eat the food and partake in the beer, um, but I really got to see what a place like this can do for a community. I saw people from completely different parts of the city and seemingly completely different types of lives come together in, in ways that I hadn't seen in a long time in this city. Um, I saw people who didn't speak the same language coming together and having a conversation about exotic fruit from one person's country and sharing it with the other person. And I saw complete strangers of two totally different generations and two totally different races tossing a beanbag together um, in a game. And while those might seem like small moments, I think as we look around at cities across the country, we are seeing that we need more places like this, more moments like that where people can really come together and organically build relationships and understand each other's cultures in ways that can hopefully move us forward together as a, as a society. Um, this year, recognizing the important connection between public art and public space, the William Penn Foundation will actually be adding a new funding program um, to our work in support of creative communities that focus on activating public spaces with performance and public art to really enrich community life and to extend the reach of the arts beyond traditional venues so that the arts are more accessible to more people across our city. Um, so as you can tell, we are incredibly passionate about this work. We are incredibly passionate about creative placemaking um, in Philadelphia and at the William Penn Foundation. And I know everyone in this room shares that passion um, for making art accessible to all and to really using it as a tool to build community. Um, people often ask me kind of what, what, what is the William Penn Foundation all about and we do many things but I think first and foremost we are a family foundation that has had its roots planted in not only Philadelphia for a long time but in the arts for nearly 65 years and so we know um, that inspiring art and accessible public spaces really help to create a vibrant Philadelphia. Um, we're thrilled to share that with you. We are really looking forward to learning from you. Um, I had the pleasure of talking with many of you last night. I look forward to meeting many more of you over the next couple of days. I know this will be a thought-provoking couple of days because Jamie never lets me leave the room without having a, at least one thought-provoking moment. Um, so we know it will be special. Um, just a couple more thanks. Uh, special thanks to Rocco Landisman for um, really having the foresight to organize the coalition that created Art Place. We feel so privileged to be a part of it. Um, thank you again to Jamie and Prentice and the entire Art Place staff for putting together a thoughtful program. Um, we're proud of what's happened in Philadelphia. Jamie has, to, to, has told us many times we also have to be really candid about the problems that we have here, and we will do that for sure. Um, but we're looking forward to learning together. Thank you so much. And then, as I think everyone knows, another foundation with an extraordinary commitment here in Philadelphia is the Knight Foundation. And last night, uh, we got to hear from Dennis Scholl, Knight's outgoing VP of Arts, in what he said will be his last official act for Art Place, although there will be many unofficial acts that we will pull him into, no doubt. Uh, and this morning, I am thrilled that we actually have a chance to hear from Knight's incoming VP for the Arts on her second day on the job, I believe. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Victoria Rogers, Knight Foundation's new Vice President for the Arts. And she wanted to make sure everyone noticed her shoes. She's wearing very good shoes this morning. Do you want to stand up? <laughs> that is totally untrue, but they are quite lovely. <laughs> I am really delighted to be here. Uh, years ago when I worked for science museums, Philadelphia was you know, the homeland, the fatherland for interactive science museums. But I think it's also fitting that today we find ourselves in the city that was where uh, philanthropy was created. Good old Benjamin Franklin all those years ago. And it's amazing for me to be here as a part of Art Place in looking at what's been done by Art Place and the impact that it has had all over the U.S. So I look forward to meeting all of you, 
Yes, I've been on board with Knight for about 32 hours. We believe in really letting you, you know, take your time <laughs> to fully become vested. But again, thank you for having me here today. I look forward to working with Jamie and the rest of the uh, Art Place board as we continue to make a significant difference in our communities. And I'm going to vamp for a second because I think Laura Sparks may have walked away with my first page of notes, <laughs> uh, which I will pull up in a second. She's do you by any chance have it with your stack? Um, but what I wanted to do... <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> how badly do you want us to do the site visits around Philadelphia? <laughs> no. And this is only important because these are the housekeeping bits that I have to make sure that I do. So the first thing I wanted to do um, is welcome the folks who are watching on the live stream. We are going to be webcasting all of the sessions uh, that we are doing in plenary mode this morning, this afternoon, and tomorrow, so that folks who aren't able to be here in person are able to participate by watching, as well as on Twitter with the hashtag Artplace Summit, as well as on Instagram, as well as on Facebook. Um, so what I wanted to sort of begin by doing was just to sort of sketch through for you what our two-day learning arc is intended to do to give you guys a sense of what we're hoping you'll get out of each of these sessions. And what we're going to do this morning is begin by talking about community and by talking about community development. And we have two extraordinary panels that will come up and talk about some really interesting community mapping work, as well as three artists that are very much working fully as artists and fully as community development um, professionals. Following that, and Laura teed this up a little bit, we want to have a conversation about the messiness of this work, right? Often when we sit around and we talk about our projects and we present them, everything is sunshine and lollipops and everything is skittles and beer and unicorns roam the streets and everything is magical. And then people get into the work and sort of say, wait a minute, this isn't what I signed up for. And so we have, I think, my favorite titled uh, panel that we've ever done at Art Place, which is called Shift Happens. Uh, and this will be a conversation with our director of uh, national grant making, Javier Torres, with Susan Tate from the Lawrence Art Center. And I, th I don't know where Susan is, but I think it's fair to say that she showed up thinking that she was in the midst of the most difficult arts-driven community development project ever. And then I had the opportunity to introduce her to Pam Atchison, who told her she didn't even rate. And I think she had a chance to meet, you know, Alex Priest from the Bemis Art Center, who said, yeah, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. So one of the things that I'm really hoping we can do is have that honest conversation about how difficult community development is, how difficult art is, how difficult arts-driven community development is. And that panel will hopefully tee up those site visits around Philadelphia Yes, so we can see the extraordinary things like the Spruce Street Park. Yes, so we can see the fabulous porch at 30th Street Station. But also, so uh, I'm doing one of the site visits with Dilworth um, Park and also talk about the setbacks and the things that didn't happen and the things that are sort of very natural to the work we're doing. So we're going to really try and encourage that candid conversation. And if you haven't signed up for an off-site visit yet, um, please make sure you do that at lunch so we can get you the instructions for where to meet, how to get there, and do all of that. You can just go out to the registration uh, table at lunch. So then tomorrow, we're actually going to be doing a little bit of a conversation about life post-Art Place. Right? We are project-driven funders, so a project gets one grant from Art Place and then not another one. We ourselves are a project that will go out of business in 2020, and so we're not going to be around um, forever. We're going to be around for another five years. And we really want to tee up what are the changes we want to make, what are the things we want to leave behind. So we're going to talk about three of the new lines of business that we've added, the community development investments that I mentioned uh, briefly last night, our research work, and our field building work. And to sort of frame that day, we're lucky enough to, we'll have an exit interview with Dennis Scholl, who will sort of talk about that notions of transitions and how do you make lasting change and what happens when it's time um, for you to turn things over to someone else. And then we'll follow that panel with a real, we'll follow that day with a really interesting panel that will be Mayor Nutter, that will be Laura Sparks, 
that will be uh, the Village of Art and Humanities, Aviva Kapust, and moderated by Rip Rapson, president of the Kresge Foundation, that will sort of be an opportunity for us to reflect on the conversations we've been having over the past day and a half. We'll have government, we'll have philanthropy, and we'll have a community-based organization talking about what this means. So that's what we're hoping that that is what we sort of intended to do with the narrative arc of these two days. So just setting those up as signposts um, that might be helpful as you listen and as you participate. Uh, in terms of real nuts and bolts housekeeping, we are together in this room until 11 a.m. There is still coffee outside, so feel free to get up and get more. There are bathrooms right outside, so after you've had the coffee, feel free to do that. Um, I am the child of public school teachers, so no disruption can stop me from talking. So just feel free to get up and go. Don't worry about it. Um, and so what I thought I would do is frame up a conversation about sort of how Art Place is thinking about this work, how we're approaching it as a prelude to bringing up Hanmin and Janet, um, which will be the really interesting and thought-provoking part of what we're doing. So um, Art Place America, uh, as you all heard last night, is now a, a partnership of 15 foundations, having just added the Stavros Niarchos Foundation as the newest member of the consortium, eight federal agencies, and six banks. And when people ask what we exist to do, what is it we're trying to get done by 2020, the simple answer is we want to reposition art and culture as a core sector of community planning and development. And what we mean by that, yeah, applause. That's, that's all right. A little revival, I like that. Um, and so what we mean by that, because people say that sounds lovely, what do you mean by that? What we mean by that is every time a mayor seats a conversation about the future of her community, we want it to be housing, transportation, art and culture, public safety, open space. And that each of those is understood as a sector that is part of a healthy, thriving community. Each of those is understood as a sector that needs planning and investment from its community. And each of those understands that it has a responsibility to contribute back to its overall community's future. And so that is really the work that we're trying to get done, and that is the work that we are trying to bring all of you into so you can sort of carry it forward beyond us. So when I talk about that, that repositioning of art and culture as a core sector of community planning and development, the question it begs is, what do you mean? Oh, sorry, I added a slide this morning. Um, it really means sort of, why would you do that? Why would you be interested in that? And one of the really exciting things that happened to us over the past year is that we um, did a partnership with the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank, and they have a journal of community development. And the issue that they published in January was devoted to creative placemaking. So, the, so one of our Federal Reserve banks has decided that creative placemaking, that art and artists have such a key role in community planning and development that they devoted an entire issue to it. Hard copies are available from the bank. It's easy to download individual articles and PDFs online. And I really encourage you to check it out, especially because 16 of the projects that are represented in this room were also written up in this. And so it's a really great resource. And we have a colleague here uh, from Deutsche Bank who actually told us a story that this journal is already making a difference. So traditionally, when a bank goes up to get its CRA credits, its Community Reinvestment Act credits, oftentimes the regulators will come in and will sort of look at the list of transactions that the bank has said are eligible. And if any of them include the word art or creative or culture, they'll be sort of automatically stricken as ineligible, right? That's that soft, puffy stuff. It has no place here. And what's interesting is because of this journal, when a bank recently went through its CRA um, exam, and the regulators tried to do that, they actually brought forward the journal and said, no, art and culture has a very serious and very significant place in community planning and development, and the transactions got through. So that is sort of a big deal, and that is kind of the change of standard operating procedure that we're hoping to drive here at Art Place. So the question that all of this begs is, what do you mean when you say community planning and development? Because that can be a little bit of an amorphous, a little bit of a squishy term. So one of the first things that um, Prentice did when he arrived at Art Place was to begin asking what various sectors meant by that. He took a look at how government was organized, how philanthropy is organized, how think tanks are organized, how community development corporations are organized. And what we discovered is that there are 10 sectors that, while not 100% comprehensive, 
cover the majority of what people mean when they say community planning and development. And those sectors, as you may or may not be able to read, are agriculture and food, economic development, environment and open space, health and human services, immigration and social justice, public safety, transportation, workforce development, and youth and education. And what we thought about was who is it in communities that is doing this work? And we realize that generally there are five kinds of players that are at work across these sectors. There are players from the government, from the private sector, from the nonprofit sector, from civic, social, and faith-based groups, so the Elks Club, Houses of Worship, and philanthropy. And so what this created was essentially a 50-cell bingo card. And what we're looking to do is sort of bring art and culture to every cell of this matrix. So whether you're a mayor who's concerned with food security, or whether you're philanthropy who's investing in youth and education, we think art and culture has unique value add to bring to every cell of this matrix. So what that means, and what we need to be able to do, is sort of talk about why we need art and culture in those 50 cells. And these are some images that I borrowed from the Irvine Foundation when they sort of talk about what art looks like. Yes, sometimes it is people in tutus and point shoes. Yes, sometimes it is extraordinary objects behind travertine marble. But oftentimes, it's people having fun. And it's that entire spectrum that we're looking to bring. And the reason we're looking to bring it, we essentially make a three-point case, right? I think the first point that's really important to understand, particularly for people who are new to this work, is that artists are the one asset that exists in every community. Right? So I'm going to say that again. Artists are the one asset that exists in every community. So not every community is lucky enough to be on a waterfront. Not every community is lucky enough to be anchored by a hospital or a university. Not every community has strong public transportation. But every community in this country has people who sing and dance and tell stories. So for the folks who are working in community development who haven't yet thought about the arts, the asset is there waiting to be activated. Right? Once you activate it, a couple things are possible that are just good bread and butter community development, right? Most art has to be consumed in person in real time, which means you have to get somewhere to do it and you want to do it with other people. So in terms of sort of, you know, good 101 community development, we're talking about foot traffic, right? Arts can drive positive presence on the street. And once you have that, once you have positive presence on the street, you begin to sort of help local economies thrive. And just to give you some context, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the part of the U.S. Department of Commerce that calculates our country's gross domestic product, did a calculation and discovered that art and cultural production accounts for $698 billion a year of GDP, which is 4.3%. And in case any of you are not macroeconomists who are following these numbers closely, that's slightly smaller than travel and tourism as an industry, and slightly larger than construction. So travel and tourism, art and cultural production, and construction are similarly sized sectors of GDP. Now, that's great, right? I love foot traffic. I love economic development. I also love the arts. If you look at my bio, I've done nothing but sort of nonprofit art and culture my entire career. But even I have to admit that if what you want is foot traffic and economic development, art may not be the most effective investment. Right? If that's all you're looking for, a soccer stadium could get you that, a multimodal transit hub could do it, a big box store could do it. So we, as a community, need to be prepared to make the case of why we also need art and culture. And I've talked about this research a lot. I actually wrote about it in the article that Art Place published uh, in the SF Fed Journal. But we, we say that the reason you also need the arts is that art and culture does something that none of those other things do. And that is art and culture helps drive more stable communities. And there's research. If any of you are interested in footnotes, I'm happy to give you to them later. But there's research funded by the Knight Foundation in partnership with Gallup that shows that art and culture actually drives attachment to community. Art and culture is the thing that makes someone call a place their home and become invested in it. There's a researcher, a fabulous anthropologist uh, who works in Chicago, who actually shows that art and culture creates social cohesion. It attaches people to people, and it does that across social group. 
So art participant acts as a master identity that actually transcends age, gender, race, ethnicity, country of origin, socioeconomic status. People who do art together recognize something in each other. And Dr. Wally actually posits that art and cultural participation is a pathway to an integrated society that doesn't involve assimilation. So I don't need to become more like you to become more closely bonded with you. And then finally, there's a researcher, a professor emeritus at UCLA, who talks about how art and culture drives civic engagement. So people who participate in the arts are more likely to vote and volunteer at higher rates than those that don't. People who participate in the arts are more likely to participate in activities beyond the arts. So those three points together, the fact that artists are present in every community already, the fact that art and culture can drive foot traffic in local economies, just like other sectors, and the fact that art and culture drives more stable communities, which is something that other sectors don't do as well, I think is a really powerful um, case for why we belong on that bingo card matrix. So as you all know, and uh, as you all have used the word, the way we approach that work is generally through the framework of creative placemaking. And creative placemaking is a phrase that wasn't in wide use in this country before the National Endowment for the Arts published this white paper by Ann Markison and Ann Gadwa called Creative Placemaking. And what's interesting to me as I've spent the last year and a half traveling the country is that if you've studied your urban planning, you hear the placemaking half of that phrase and you instantly get in the mindset of Jane Jacobs, Holly White, and all of their colleagues who were talking about community planning and development that was local, that was human-centric, and that was comprehensive. That's the lineage that we're looking to invite artists and arts organizations into. But what's been interesting is if you don't know that, if you haven't read The Death and Life of Great American Cities, uh, if you haven't sort of studied the work of the Project for Public Spaces, you hear the creative half of that word, of that phrase, and you instantly go into sort of a Richard Florida 1.0 mindset that thinks what we're talking about is a hundred shiny, happy, creative people who live in this world, and whichever mayor gets the most number of them to move to his or her community wins, and as their prize, they get a couple of bicycles, a Starbucks, and a gay couple, right? <laughs> And that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> that is not what we're talking about. So it's, you know, keep Jane Jacobs in mind because that's the lineage that we're looking to uh, inherit. So as we're talking about creative placemaking, people, as I go around this country, sort of say, what is it that you're talking about? How does this happen um, in life? We really say, think about four things that a project is, is looking to do. And what we're going to do this morning is focus on those two points. So after I run through these um, four phrases, Hanmen and Janet, you guys are up. So this is your warning. You're on deck. Um, but the four things that we're really looking to do is begin by defining a place-based community, right? There are folks who have all sorts of communities, communities of aspiration, communities of affiliation, all sorts of communities. We're talking about a group of people who live and work in the same place and that you should literally be able to draw a circle on a map. And we're talking about that group of people right? Place-based community. Number two, we're looking for some community development change that that group of people would like to see. What's a problem with housing that needs to be fixed? What's an opportunity with transportation that needs to be seized? What is a narrative with social justice that needs to be changed? What is momentum with youth and education that needs to be continued? But what is some change that we would like to see? Number three, we then want to figure out how art and culture can help achieve that change for that group of people, right? So how can the arts do that thing for these people? And then fourth, and this is something that we'll pick up tomorrow uh, with Jamie Hand, our director of research, is we want, you're trying to make a change in a community. We simply want folks to have a way of knowing whether that change has happened. And so some who sort of come from philanthropy speak will go into sort of project evaluation and outcomes assessment and, you know, theories of change and all of that. We're simply talking about you should know when you can stop doing the thing you've been doing, right? You're doing something to try and get something changed. Has the change happened? When can you move on?